So we're going to start in about one or two minutes. No. I see. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I think we'll go ahead and start. Welcome to the Aspen Ideas Festival and to the Thomson Reuters Knowledge Exchange, where our topic this morning is social, uh, social media, social, social world. I'm Charlie Firestone. I direct the Aspen Institute Communications and Society Program, a policy program looking at the impact of communications and information technology, and I'll be your moderator this morning. Um, so social media, what do we mean by it? Um, we've been in social media all our lives, in personal person communications, parties, work, home, but what's, something's different now, and what is that? And uh, clearly, uh, the interactive electronic media has made a, a huge difference. It's changed us from one-to-one -one, uh, communications to one-to-many, and now to many to many uh, communications. Um, so the elements that uh, we, uh, as I define it uh, at least, is the blending of technology and social interaction for the co-creation of value. And a lot of talk uh, these days about uh, user-generated uh, content. Um, but value to whom? You know, the internet started as a research medium. And uh, actually by the military, it became a commercial boom. Again, we're seeing that here with uh, social media, where uh, today, uh, let's you know, Facebook has over apparently over 700 and million, 750 million people who have signed up in some way. Now, obviously, not nearly anywhere near that number use it, but think about what connects 750 million people in the world today, and uh, uh, other than a country. Uh, and we have two countries in the world that large, uh, and then Facebook. Um, so as we, uh, you know, just a few of the statistics, uh, social networking now accounts for over 22% of time spent on, uh, online in the United States. It might be a much larger, that's actually uh, maybe a dated figure. Uh, a couple of days ago, the Twitter founders um, said that there are, um, a billion tweets every six days. Uh, the, the, the largest growing population getting on social media is the uh, 55 and older, and 65 and older grew 100% last year, uh, so that one in four people in that age group are now part of some social networking. So we're looking uh, at how social media is used personal and collective uh, for good works and for commercial. Uh, and maybe even uh, some negative aspects uh, for organizing, protesting, and even destroying. So this panel will look at the good and the bad of uh, social media. So to address this, we have a great panel. Uh, to my right is Bob Shukai, who's head of global mobile technology for Thomson Reuters. He has a past uh, uh, doing uh, social media for uh, Turner Broadcasting, and prior to that, a, distinguished career uh, at Motorola, culminating in heading up 3D, 3G strategy and business development. Um, next, we have Sherry Turkle, who is the uh, Abby Rockefeller Mousy, I should have gotten, Mose, uh, professor of social studies and science uh, at uh, MIT. She is a very distinguished uh, psychologist and has written a trilogy of books on uh, her studies of people dealing with uh, this kind of technology, people and technology. Life on the screen is a uh, classic, but she has a trilogy in that area and uh, uh, actually has a, a more uh, recent book, um, which is uh, Alone Together, which is great. She has great titles of her books, like they're the best. Uh, next is uh, Bill Powers, who also is great at uh, naming his books, Hamlet's, Hamlet's Blackberry, a bestseller, a New York Times bestseller. He has a distinguished career in journalism and has also uh, served on a Senate staff. Um, next is, is Emily Jacoby, and she's co-founder and executive director of Digital Democracy and a 
human rights. Uh, she's worked at other human rights organizations and also Internews, uh, which is a great organization uh, in the past. So she's young as she is, seems to have a long and distinguished career in this, in this field. And finally, uh, Vivian uh, Schiller, who is head of, uh, she's chief digital officer. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> she's about to become chief digital officer of NBC News. Uh, we know her, she's a familiar uh, speaker here at Aspen. Uh, she uh, last was the uh, CEO of National Public Radio. Uh, before that has distinguished journalistic career uh, Discovery Communications, Turner Communications, uh, CNN, and, uh, and also notably headed NewYorkTimes.com. So uh, to start us off, I'm going to ask uh, Bob to uh, just give us an overview of social media and particularly the combination of social media with mobile technology. So you've got two huge trends coming together. You absolutely do. Thank you, Charlie, and good morning, everyone. We truly do live in amazing times. When you look around, it's a confluence of two massive things taking place. The explosion of social media and the number of mobile phones that continue to be shipped year on year. This year as an industry, we'll sell 1.6 billion mobile phones. A huge chunk of those will be smartphones. We spend a big chunk of our life, <clears throat> excuse me, being connected. We're checking our status, our email. Most of you right now aren't even listening to me because you're tweeting or doing whatever the heck you're doing. Am I right? It's true. But in some ways, this is a wonderful thing, right? Because we look at the Arab uprising. How did that story take place and unfold? By a Twitter, Facebook, citizen journalism. The entire bin Laden story went down because a guy in Pakistan sat there and noticed some weird things going on around him, tweeted, and became an instant celebrity. But with this comes a bit of a challenge. And here's what it is. This connectedness that's been created has turned us into electronic junkies. And there's no other way to put it. And I have to admit, I'm probably the worst. With a Blackberry, Google phone, Symbian phone, not done yet, Sony Ericsson phone. When he goes into a bar, he has to unload. <laughs> Come check me out in an airport sometime. It's not pleasant. My Windows phone, my iPhone. Do you seriously carry all those around? I have, I have usually about 12 or 13 phones all connected at any one time. And but why? So, <laughs> because I gotta be connected, I gotta share stuff. No, you, what it is, you know, in my, in my industry, it's really important to understand how these technologies work across the variety of, of device types that are out there. But what it has done to us, really, you know, whether it's one phone you carry or an awful lot, of you probably have two or three, it's turned us into a hyper-connected state where we spend our lives trying to put everything up on Twitter, so much so that we are no longer communicating as human beings. I know. I read your, I read your quotes. They're, they're absolutely brilliant. I mean, think about what happens at dinner time. We're texting each other. If you take one thing away, and me as a global head of mobile technology, and I love phones, take this, you can put it in Twitter. Every once in a while, put your damn phone down and start interacting with human beings. Well, we're gonna, we have two people on the uh, panel who will delve into that uh, topic uh, in, in more depth. Uh, but before we do that, Vivian, I uh, want to ask you, we want to first go out and see how the social media are being used for positive uh, way, in positive ways. And you know, the news media, uh, at first it was thought that social media were, was a uh, kind of competitor uh, and uh, detractor from the uh, media, but now media uses. So how do, how do social media help us as citizens learn more about the world through journalism? It, it is, social media is the greatest boon to journalism since the printing press. I mean, it is an extraordinary tool. I mean, to be sure, people can use it, you know, the, the, there, there are people that use it for, for ill or people that use it for just a bunch of noise. The noise to signal ratio can be a little distorted sometime. But for journalism, and we should all care about journalism even if we're not journalists because we are the beneficiary of the information that journalists provide, a, a definition, by the way, of journalists that is, that is becoming broader and morphing a little bit. But the notion of it's not just about, in the beginning, 
and, and for some news organizations, foolishly, it's only about a way to automatically push out your headlines. That's not the promise of social media. Okay, great, you can use it as a promotional tool. But what we've seen emerge in the last few years is social media as an extraordinary way to report the news, to verify the news, and to interact with the audience. Because the fact is, there are, no matter how good your news organization is, and I feel proud to have worked for some extraordinary news organizations, there are people out in the world on any given story who are going to know more about it than you do. So to use, to have social media available as a way to interact and as a way to engage with people who know about the story is good for the audience, it's good for journalism, it's good for the truth, it's good for uh, objectivity. And I can give you a million examples of it, but, but I, I see no downside to Well, what media. about the downside of people tweeting and getting out false information or uh, pushing the journalists to uh, say that um, Gabby Gifford is dead before she's dead and um, before she's, you know, while she's alive? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, so there are... Uh, but, but all that is, but to me, that is not a product of social media. That's just a product of idiocy. I mean, you can't, if you're, <laughs> sorry, but, I mean, the same rules that apl apply no matter whether you're, you know, in print or whether you're chiseling in tablets, which is, you know, who are your sources, have you verified it, and, you know, the fact is, I guess you can, you know, you can, you know, you got a faster trigger figure, fig finger with Twitter and with Facebook. Um, but, you know, so we're human beings, we need to try to resist that urge. But in terms of putting, putting out false information, again, I see only a benefit because of, you know, the so-called wisdom of the crowds. I say wisdom because sometimes the wisdom isn't so wise. But if you put out false information, because there are so many people who are interacting with you, you will be able to, it's easier to shoot down false information. Than, than, than ever before. Many news organizations are struggling with, you know, code of conduct and ethics and all of that. And, you know, we're all writing these elaborate, you know, rules, do this, don't do that. But it really all boils down to just don't be stupid. Okay. So, Emily, Jacoby, you've been out uh, doing this digital democracy, particularly in the developing world. So how is uh, social media uh, helping the developing world and um, in, in terms of enhancing their, uh, their uh, you know, ability to live good lives? That's actually the question that led us to, I co-founded Digital Democracy in 2008, and um, I guess as, as the only millennial on this panel and as somebody who you know, grew up, uh, I, was, I was in college when Facebook came out and saw how the lives of my, myself and my friends post-college in particular were really being impacted by all these tools and our ability to connect even as we dispersed around the world. Um, a couple of years later, so my background was in youth journalism and youth media. From a young age, I'd been engaging with how media can help amplify the voices of people whose voices aren't always heard. So in particular case, young people's voices. And in 2007, I was doing research on the Thai-Burma border, um, working with Burmese refugees, um, young people. We interviewed 100 young people between the ages of 15 and 25. And we found a correlation between internet access and self-identification as activists. Um, and in the qualitative interviews, they really spoke about how if they were able, even if it was through their mobile phone, even if it was just once a week at the refugee camp through the cyber cafe that they were able to get online, that demonstrably impacted their lives. It helped them feel more connected, more hopeful about the future, um, less isolated and less depressed. And so the question for us moving forward is, how do you harness these tools to really empower groups like refugees, uh, women's groups, um, all these marginalized communities to have, to have a seat at the table? And then f later that year, fall 2007, there was a, um, the largest uprising in a generation inside Burma, also known as Myanmar. And Burmese monks and lay people protested, had the huge um, numbers of people in the street, 100,000. And that was all organized because of mobile phones and because of the internet. It was not possible otherwise. And the Burmese government set a precedent that we've seen borne out in that when they cracked down violently against the protesters, they shut down the internet and mobile phones for five full days. So you have the twin opportunities and the incredible dangers. You know, these tools heighten our connection and also heighten the risk. 
And um, you know, in 2007, when we first started, that was a new concept. But now in 2011, we see that's borne out across the world. And we've seen you know, friends of mine, young people in countries all over the world using these tools. So for us, the fundamental question is, how do we harness these tools for a positive impact? Great. So uh, Sherry Turkle, a psychologist, and has studied this for, for many years. Um, Sounding like social media is just a great thing. It's empowering. It's getting people out of their isolation. What's not to like? Well, I don't think it's a question of what not to. <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think it's a question of what not of what's not to like. I think I think of it in terms of affordances and vulnerabilities. These technologies have extraordinary affordances, and then we have human vulnerabilities. And when we understand our human vulnerabilities. We can better use these technologies to empower us. But we do have human vulnerabilities, um, as, you've pointed out, as you've pointed out. And I prefer to think of them, quite frankly, as vulnerabilities rather than as addictions. Because if you are addicted, there's only one thing you can do, which is give it up. And that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. These are the technologies of our lifetime. These are the technologies with which we're living our human adventure. So using the metaphor of addiction just makes us feel powerless and impotent. I think if we use the metaphor of our vulnerabilities to this very powerful um, technology that offers us things like the godfather, it makes us offers we can't refuse, we can better understand how to be less vulnerable and more empowered in the presence of this technology, how to live more, it's like a diet, how to be on a digital diet that the health, in which we make healthier choices with it. So for example, here are some of our vulnerabilities. Um, there's a great saying, uh, really, that comes out of the Freudian tradition, that loneliness has failed solitude. And if you don't teach your children, if you don't teach your children um, how to be alone, They'll only know how to be lonely. And really, what I'm seeing in my research is a kind of genesis of a new sensibility of I share, therefore I am. That I'd rather text than talk. Kids are feeling that they're, they're, generating, the, they're generating their feeling as they're texting it. And they only feel themselves, I mean, I don't know if you have the current numbers, I know the 35,000 texts a month. I mean, the number of texts are going up, the number of calls are going down. And what this means, and what I've been studying over 15 years, is that kids basically are texting as they're feeling the emotion. So it goes from, I have a feeling, I want to make a call, to I want to have a feeling, I need to send a text. In other words, that the generation of a feeling is all wrapped up in the sharing of a feeling. And um, you're beginning to lose the capacity for solitude that um, replenishes and restores. Now, that's not the fault of a cell phone. That's the, if, that's the opportunity for parents who, to stop texting at the breakfast table, to stop texting at dinner, I interview the parents who tell me that they, they won't take a walk to the candy store with their kids without bringing the phones. And so it's an opportunity for the culture as a whole to, I don't know, to kind of take a breath, get a grip, and begin to reprioritize and say, look, we want to live with this technology, but we also want to live a little bit more in the present, particularly with our children, so that they can you know, learn to be, be here. I mean, this is a we're at a beautiful place, and I have a summer home in a beautiful place. I have a summer home in the dunes where Thoreau walked. And I've walked those dunes for generations. I haven't walked them for generations. I've wa <laughs> I've, I've wa people have walked them for generations. I've walked them for decades. And people now walk those dunes with their heads in their phones. And, and that shouldn't be happening. They walk those dunes with their heads in their phones, with their children whose heads are also in their phones. And that's the kind of thing where you think about affordances and vulnerabilities. And you, you lead, I, I think of it now as learning to live more in the present tense. So that's the kind of thing where I think it's in our control and we, 
get to okay. cultivate that. And Bill Powers, uh, you've also been somewhat critical, but how, is it, how does this impact our society? This, you know, looking at how it impacts, as Sherry has, the, the individual psyche. What's the broader uh, picture? Right, well, thank you. Um, I think the broader message is really that everything everybody has said on this panel is actually true at the same time. And not only that, but the good news, and this is sort of the main message of my book, is that we have been here before. You know, we t we, everybody who lives in every era in history thinks, oh, this is the first time X, Y, and Z has happened. And aren't we brilliant? We've come up with these tools, we're doing all these things for the first time, and so forth. And what I did in, in embarking on Hamlet's Blackberry is I wanted to sort of solve this conundrum for myself in my family life where I was feeling this very issue in my work life where I was finding I couldn't do my best thinking anymore because I was on these tools all the time. And I think if you're going to engage in this co-creation that you talked about, Charlie, you have to bring your self, best self to the creation. You have to bring the best self that's in here to that transaction. And if you're always skating the surface, and navigating your tweets and your Facebook updates, you are not bringing your best self to that transaction. So how do you unknot this problem? And what I do in the book is I go back to seven moments in history where something quite analogous to this happened. A new tool, revolutionary, came along. Tremendous excitement, all these benefits. And at the same time, gradually, it dawns on people every single time that there are downsides, that you can't pursue a a strategy of using these things all day and night because that's not going to get you anywhere. You're going to be in this place where you're kind of basically a zombie, a prisoner of the tool, instead of a great co-creator making a better world with digital tools, which is what we should do. You know, Seneca, the great Roman philosopher who was also for a time actually running the empire, one of the busiest people on earth probably in history ever, talked about the struggle of using written language and of dealing with empire, which itself was a new form of connectedness. How do we manage all this stuff happening in this new thing called a city that is Rome? How, he, he talked about he and his colleagues suffering from the restless energy of a hunted mind. And I love that phrase. I think that's how I've been living, the restless energy of a hunted mind. So what I suggest in the book is simply, not enough time to lay it out here, but simply a new philosophy. I think we've been living by a philosophy, which Bob's phones are sort of a symbol of, of the more the better. I call it digital maximalism. You can't get enough of this stuff 24-7. And I just think we need a more common sense, human philosophy of balance, of offsetting all that connectedness every day with some disconnectedness, with solitude, or with direct conversation with people right in the same room with you, your family, all of you with us here now. There's at, at least as much, and I would argue more ultimately, to be gained from this kind of transaction as from that one. And we just need to sort of put the two together to get to that wonderful place of co-creation. So, uh, Bob, the, you know, took a little hit, uh, all, all these phones, but how do, you, um, how do you see the benefit uh, to you of using uh, social media in, in your own empire? I mean, you, we all have an empire today. Uh, to, to run, to deal with, to uh, engage. Um, and, you know, do you feel like, are you feeling like you're, well, you did start at the beginning say, hey, we, we need to stop too, but you're, you seem to be I embrace rolling. I, I do, and I, and I love it. In fact, while we were talking, and I, I paused for a second because I had to check in on Foursquare. So that's been sorted out. Um, I did. <laughs> I had forgotten to this morning, but I'm on. Um, I, I think, you know. What does that do for you? What, what is checking why, into Foursquare? So, <laughs> yesterday, yesterday uh, De Dennis Crowley and the Foursquare guys introduced the brand new 10 100 badge, meaning you have checked in a thousand times. So, with my check in yesterday, I was already way past thousand. It was, in a, it was a new badge. And so, it's, it's a bit of a game to okay. some extent. And so, so you get benefit. You, you uh, are seen as someone who uh, has uh, achieved in this area or has. Uh, in other words, what, we it doesn't talked. motivate me. I don't really care. I mean, I'm the mm -hmm. mayor of 28 places in Foursquare, whatever the number is. <laughs> who cares? I mean, in the big scheme of things, who cares? Now, the thing that is actually kind of funny about all this connectedness stuff, I and mean, we, we are living in a way where we are truly hyper-connected. And, you know, we can talk to people anytime, any place in the world. You can stand on the Great Wall of China at Bada Ling and get better signal than I get in my house in Atlanta, Georgia which is a pretty amazing thing when you think about it. 
But here's the, kind of the interesting thing about all this. In spite of us being very, very hyper-connected, air travel has not dropped. People still travel. Why? Because we still have that emotional need to connect with people on a one-to-one -one basis, to shake their hand, to see their eyes, to see the facial expression, because you can't necessarily extract emotion from a pithy 140-character tweet. Yeah, but we're going to, you know, we're going to be having video social networking. We're going to be able to see people, and, and I, that's my next question is, and, and then I want to go to the audience because we have a lot of very knowledgeable people uh, in the audience, probably some more mayors. Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, where, where do we see this going in, uh, in terms of... Uh, I, I, I'll show you. Uh, there is a cost. Uh, I, I agree very much that we see... Um, uh, an increased desire to come together in places like this, even as uh, I, I'm very moved by what you were saying that you know the, the the old journalism rules who what when where why how and checking don't die just because you get social media. I agree completely, and we're moved very much to come to places like this, even though we're online. But let me just bring very down to earth the kind of cost that I'm talking about. I've been studying birthday parties of 15 year olds. Why birthday parties of 15-year-olds? Here they all have their social media. They all are, they're as, they're as big on Foursquare as you are, maybe not as many mayorships as you, but still. Um, why, why birthday, because birthday parties of 15-year-olds is the perfect place to study what I call the bailout phenomenon that's, that social media provides. Anybody who's, who's had a 15-year-old or knows a 15-year-old or who's ever been 15 knows that there's a point at a 15-year-old birthday party where everybody wants to leave because it gets very hard. Because you have to talk, particularly if it's a co-ed party, you have to talk to the other people. And it's very hard and it's very awkward. And you want to go, they want to go. But if they don't go, and if they force themselves to do this, they get closer by the end of the party to being 16. And something developmental happens that's very powerful. And at the birthday parties I'm studying now, where, you know, I'm an ethnographer, I'm a, I'm a fly on the wall, I don't you know, ask them probing questions. I'm, they open their phone. They go on to Facebook, and they haven't left the party, but essentially they've left the party because they don't have to talk to each other. And it's what happens at funerals. I'm studying people texting at funerals, or texting at dinner parties, or texting at all the moments in relationships, or where, 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 where in conversations where something gets hard and you take out your phone. All those moments that we don't have to be present to each other now. And 15-year-old birthday parties just happens to be like a great case. So sure there's something, there's, even though we are still craving more getting together at the same time that we're doing more social networking, there are these subtle ways in which we're allowing ourselves these bailouts and it, in businesses, as much as in personal life. I mean, I would argue that for every example I have for personal life, I have business examples and corporate examples where people are not being present to each other in ways they need to be. And if I could just jump yeah. in on that, you know that the businesses are beginning to realize they're paying a bottom line cost for this. The most recent study shows that a 1,000 employee American company is losing $10 million a year to distracted workers because of this issue of recovery time. It's called recovery time. When you leave task A and go to task B, when you try to go back to task A, there's this long period of re-immersing yourself. Where was I? Getting your focus back. That is not efficiency, which is what these tools are supposed well, to be giving other, us. It's inefficiency. Sure, but on the other hand, you have companies that are putting out questions that get access knowledge both within their organization and outside the organization that uh, put up questions and get knowledge uh, back and are very, and that has turned out to be a very efficient way 
of uh, innovation and progressing within an organization. I would argue, and perhaps as a subject for another panel, that for every distracted moment you have at work because you are uh, doing something that has to do with your personal life, you have maybe, or maybe I'm just speaking from my own experience, you have two times the moments where work is interfering, work is intruding on your personal life. And so, you know, it all becomes just a 24 hour blur. Well, well is, hasn't social media actually fostered this 24 seven mentality that we, I mean, uh, we, we've kind of seen that. Let's get into the, let's ask the audience to get some questions right away because uh, uh, if we can get a mic right over there, because I, I think this is being um, recorded, please say who you are, uh, and we'll call first on Don Tapscott, who okay. is um, right, right here, oh. up front. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, you've got, you've got it. Okay, so you've got the mic. So say who you are. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Abigail Wenner, and I live in Washington, D.C., and actually I work in the corporate side and work with senior executives who are running companies and are struggling with the dichotomy between the senior executives and the older baby boomers and the younger generation coming in. Social media, the younger generation so adept and the older generation not quite capable of um, either wanting to learn it or very, uh, they're not as facile with it. Uh, uh, in studying this, uh, there's a whole um, neuroscience component to this. And um, the younger generation has been dealing with this multitasking and the social media for a very long time so that their brains are actually programmed in a very different way. So it's, it's not as easy as saying we have to teach them to be more personal. They really have been playing with video games, et cetera. Um, Daniel Carr wrote a whole book about how this is affecting the younger generation's way of thinking. I was, and senior executives want to, we need to mold so, the two. Has anybody here on the panel worked or looked into the, how the effects of the neuroscience on social media is affected? I'm talking the corporations, but in terms yeah. of society as well. Sure. Yes, there, there's no question but that uh, Google is changing the way we think. I mean, that, that, that our brains are being shaped by the by the multitasking itself. I mean, just take multitasking as the simplest thing. And the, the um, multitasking has another aspect even before you get to the brain chemistry, which has to do with the way it affects the reward structure, which is that even though our performance degrades with every new task, we, we multitask we feel as though we're doing better and better as we multitask because we're being neurochemically rewarded. So there's this incredible paradox that multitaskers feel, those young people feel as though they're doing better and better at the jobs as they do more and more jobs, even though their performance on each of those jobs is actually worse and worse. So they can't be convinced that they're doing worse and worse. So there's a, there's a, let's, yeah. Let's get a millennial. Yeah. So. Well, I, I would say that I don't, I don't know that that's actually the case. I mean, and, and granted, I haven't studied this from a scientific perspective, but I think I see lots of young people, I see lots of 20-somethings at least, um, very frustrated by new tools. A lot of my friends refuse to even touch Twitter. They don't want to know anything about it. They don't want to have anything to do with it because they already feel like they're connected enough. Um, and and it, I mean, without a doubt, young people are more connected and there, there's lots of different tools we use. But, but I think I also see young people putting up a lot of barriers and, and boundaries around what they will and won't do. And you know, Dana Boyd's research really bears us out as well in terms of um, amongst teenagers, you know, the, the kinds of rules that they put on. So, and the other thing I would say is, talking about social media and some of the always on problems, I, I see email as a huge problem. Um, email used to be, you know, when, when the first days of dial-up, you would, you would write some nice messages and they were almost like letters and you would send them out and somebody would get them when they logged online. And now with our phones that have us connected to email all the time, you do feel like you're always on and you always have to be working and you can't turn that off. And, um, and I think that's really a challenge as well in reforming how we, culturally, how we approach email, I also see as a real need for us learning that balance. Okay, I, I, we're, we're gonna need to get some more questions out there. So I'm, I'm Bill, I'm just gonna cut you off. So, um, 
another one over there, then, then these two if, with the microphone, if you could come down and pick up these right along here. Hi, my name is Jolie Davis. Uh, with regards to texting, I have seen uh, that with my two daughters, uh, the benefit of the communication that they bring in uh, giving us their, their deep feelings. The, the negative thing that I feel is that through texting, they're able to say things that they can't say on a one-to-one -one basis. And how? what is your suggestion as to how do we encourage them to say those things on a one-to-one -one basis that they can only say through texting? So I, I, think, I think that's a little, you know, I don't worry about it personally. I have, I have two kids, 13 and 10, who are texting machines, you know, and, and, and yet you, you, you make the time to interact personally. You know, it, it's, if, if, we, if we just stand back and let people do what they're doing, then we're just as responsible and just as guilty for promoting that kind of behavior. It's all, it's all about the personal responsibility that we have as, as parents, as relatives, as friends, to say enough is enough and to create that personal connection. I personally don't worry about it. In fact, I think the hyperconnectivity, by and large, is a good thing. By and large. But, but you have to have things in balance. And in fact, Peter Jackson ran a, ran a great session the other day from, from Thomson Reuters, and, and he talked about it. it's no longer a work-life balance. It's a work-life blur. And he's absolutely right. And, and so to your kids, all you, all you got to do is just get them to express themselves in other ways, through art, through music, things like that. Aaron Dworkin ran a beautiful session yesterday on art and music. And when he talks about the way that music expresses yourself, you, you've got to be able to encourage kids to do something other than hold the phone in their hand. Back to what I said. Every once in a while, put the damn phone down. Okay. Let's get the microphone up. And... Uh... Next one. Yeah, uh, my name is Don Tapscott. Just a nit on the Great Wall of China. I was there last week and the connection was pretty good, uh, but I couldn't get on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or a whole bunch of other things. So. I don't think you can look at this issue without looking at the generational differences on, on every front. In terms of the brain science, uh, you know, I think there's a growing body of knowledge that says that young people's brains are different and that they're more able to so-called multitask. It's actually not multitasking, it's better active working mem memory and better switching abilities. And in the workforce, I think it would be a terrible mistake to imply that social media is, is somehow bad. I mean, my research shows that companies that embrace uh, industrial strength, social networks, and uh, microblogging, and Twitter, and wikis, and jams, and ideation tools, and so on, actually perform better. They have a better metabolism, they have better innovation, they have better relationships with customers. And in a sense, this is becoming a new operating system for business. And social media is really becoming social production. It's a new mode of production. And in the workforce, young people do work differently. And there's lots of evidence to say that we ought to be learning from that and changing our models of work because in their culture is a new culture of work that's a, a more high performance culture. So. Uh Don is going to be speaking later. Uh, he's the author of Wikonomics and some other books. I think, let, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say that on the companies, I mean, I have no doubt that there are many, many companies who are doing fabulously with these technologies. They're the ones who are using them smartly and wisely. But no, I, would, I, say, I would venture to say, based on my experience of the last year of tra talking to a lot of companies, I think most of them are kind of lost and at sea and trying to figure out how to do it wisely and not lose that $10 million a year to distracted employees. And so it's, I think we're, you know, we have to realize that we're at the beginning of this. It's a learning curve and we're learning together. And we're kind of, I think we're kind of not that great at it so far, but we're getting there. We're working on it, we're improving, and it's all about being smart at home and at the office and putting the tool in the proper place and Good. perspective. We're going to multitask a little bit now. So Peter, Miriam, and uh, that person there, and we're going to hear comments from you and then get something uh, back from our panel and, and have to wrap it up. Uh, Peter Jackson, um, we talked about presence versus non-presence, but we haven't talked about synchronicity. I think one of the things that's really interesting and powerful about social media is that it's something can, that can happen in real time, whether it's texting or chat, or it's something that can happen more like email in an asynchronous fashion. And in, you know, there are situations where presence is overrated. So you, know, you don't always get to find that person you want at the cocktail party. You, know, you don't always get to sit next to that person you'd like to sit next to on the bus. Whereas you know, through social media, you have a lot more options. 
And I think some of the problems that, that we're facing, you know, we, is a matter of control. It's a matter of self-discipline and learning how to use these devices better. But on the upside, I see just nothing but huge convenience. Maryam Alavi, uh, Professor of Technology Strategy at Emory University. I think uh, one of the factors that is going to be important to incorporate in this whole discussion has to do, particularly in a business and organizational setting, has to do with task as a contingency. If the task is locating and communicating information, then these kind of technologies are great. You know, we talked about how important it is in journalism to get to the information in a timely fashion or verify. But if the task requires deep thinking, creativity, problem solving, uh, these are the kind of tasks that multitasking and split second attention to them are not going to lead to desirable outcomes. So we need to also think about what are we trying to get accomplished in terms of the task. OK. Uh, this woman right over here. Um, I w Courtney Martin, a journalist. Um, I wanted to ask about a lot of smart people have said there's kind of this balkanization in the internet. So we are more connected, but we're actually choosing to be connected to people who think just like we do. So we sort of create this little world of our own where we kind of echo chamber with other people. Um, and I think that's incredibly dangerous. So I was wondering if the panel would address kind of the, the negative part of having so much control of who we listen to on a daily basis online. OK. So this session is incredibly short. Uh, and we have uh, a lot of great knowledge, and we're kind of multitasking and having 140-character uh, uh, bits coming in. But what I want to do is uh, uh, kind of go back uh, around, starting with Vivian, and uh, answer any of the questions and sum up your, your point on uh, social media. Well, actually, I'd love to address that, because it's a very interesting issue, particularly in, in, in journalism. Uh, if you are a journalistic entity, of course, it's a boon because you can more easily reach the people who are most likely to like you and want to be connected with you. But I totally agree that the, the danger from, from individuals, I, I don't know that this is the organizations that can do this, is for individuals, is that they will become so attracted and go deeper and deeper and deeper into, the, uh, into following the same people that it does become uh, a, a, an echo chamber. But the flip side of that, and I guess the good news, is that you begin to see in places like common streams on Facebook, which personally I've found have been much more productive kind of discussions than even common streams that happen on, on a news organization's website um, because of identity. That's a whole other issue. That you, be, you really begin to see a robust discussion. And I've been more encouraged by some of the discussion, the online discussion I've seen with people bringing different perspectives to the table. So, so you know, as we've said, we're in so the beginning of this. But that's a risk that I think we need to be mindful of. So I just wanted to use my time to address that issue, because I think it's an important one. I also think that's a really important issue. And it, and it ties in a little bit to your point about tasks. Um, and for us, the foundation is, as we've developed our programs and work in partnership with grassroots groups who often are, are getting, uh, certainly at the social media for the first time, they may have a little bit of email already. They may already do texting, uh, SMS, just amongst themselves. Um, we really focus on digital literacy. So understanding what are the tools, and how do you use them, and to what effect, and to what impact. And, and I think that we need that here, too, even though we might, um, in the United States, you know, know about a lot of tools, often people don't understand what, how you can leverage a tool for a particular purpose. Um, and then in terms of the echo chamber, I think it's, it's just critical to really actively be seeking out other voices and to be listening to other voices. And so a lot of our work, again, is about helping people whose voices are really strong and have really powerful things to say but are not normally heard, use these tools which are um, you know, lower cost and which are easier. You know, it's, 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 it's amazing the ability for social media to amplify the voices of people who otherwise would never be quoted in a newspaper article to actually be telling us what's happening in Tahrir Square, um, telling us what's happening uh, you know, in the streets of, um, of Saudi Arabia as women are driving, for the, for, you know, driving in protests against the law. So, so there's a kind of an interesting confluence. And for me, the key in any society is digital literacy. Uh, yeah, I would just sum up by saying that I think it's helpful at this point in our evolution of, as a digital society to remember that the most powerful tool we have at our disposal is not the one we have in our pocket. It's the one up here. And we can take that tool 
and apply it to these newer ones and use them more wisely. You know, I see many people have been tweeting here and, and, and updating and so forth, and that's fine if that works for you. But remember to be thoughtful about it. Before we came over here, I tweeted about this gathering, and I urged my followers to, to, to tune in if they could and said I would be back to tell you what happened. But I haven't been with them while I've been here. I've been present here with you guys trying to make this the best gathering I can. And I think we should move from connectedness to relative disconnectedness and back. And that way, we're going to do this co-creation in the best way we possibly can. I was very struck by what Emily said about you know the emails too much. I mean you you know, and in my research for Loan Together, I interviewed uh, hundreds of uh, young people over 15 years and kind of did a cohort study and heard that story so often of people starting to feel kind of overwhelmed by the technology and facing a paradox that I'd like to address just as my closing remark. And the paradox is is that we're telling this generation that their world is increasingly complex. I mean, that basically is the story we're telling, and we're sticking to it because it is increasingly complex. But we've created this communications culture where we're ratcheting up the volume and velocity of our messaging. I mean, and some of us have fewer phones than you, but we're still getting more and more. I mean, how many, how many messages do you get a day? 100, 200, 300, 400, 500? That ratchets up the volume and velocity. And whether it's individuals or organizations, what I've found in my research for Alone Together is that people start to simplify the questions so they can get an immediate answer back. If you want an immediate answer back, you start to ask a simpler question. It's natural. If, you need, if your organization needs to get it right back, you start to ask a simpler question. So subtly, you start to shape the question to get the answer because you need to know now. So part of that adaptation is volume and velocity up. The world is more complicated, but we're asking and answering simpler questions. It's like we're all putting ourselves on cable news. And I think that this is um, one of the things that we need to address straight on as to whether or not we're not somehow in some kind of disconnect between the communications regime that we've created for ourselves and the uh, reality of the challenges that we face. I think for me, the greatest thing about social media is the exposure to ideas and new people and new cultures. You know, there are 900 million people in China with a mobile phone today, almost that many in India. Go to Kenya, where 99% of the internet traffic is not occurring on a PC. It's coming off a mobile device. I'm teaching myself Swahili right now on an iPad app. How on earth would I have ever known about an iPad app for Swahili if I hadn't been exposed to somebody through AfroInnovator.com putting out a story saying, hey, this is out here? My mind has been open to new ideas, new people, things that I can't even describe because of the power of social media and mobile technology. But everything has to be done in balance. And that's probably the most important thing I'd say. Use the technology to build those connections. Get yourself exposed to more ideas. But don't forget, there is this need to connect as human beings on a personal level. OK, so we've uh, gone through the good and the bad, making value judgments, um, the, the positive uh, aspects. Um, we've seen how much these tools can, can do for us as individuals, as societies, as uh, workplaces, and uh, some of the negatives. I've come away thinking a little bit more about the attention economy, that the attention is our scarcity these days. And as we have more and more inputs, uh, we have to be more thoughtful about what we put attention to. I thought Bill's comment about that uh, right here is, you know, really uh, drove that forward. And my second strong takeaway was the issue of personal responsibility in many different levels. The personal responsibility to yourself, um, to be both a diverse and uh, curious and learning individual, but also to be a responsible, caring, engaging one. Uh, the, your responsibility to citizenship, um, you know, to your community, which we really didn't get into. We got into it a little bit uh, in the developing world, but uh, there's a whole 
uh, area of how are we uh, engaging with other people in our local communities in the workplace, whether it's getting in other inputs, whether it's doing tasks, how, how we do it, uh, a collective intelligence, uh, you know, the, the possibilities are tremendous there, and ultimately to our society, what kind of society do we want to have, and, uh, you know, what's possible. And I, I, I leave with a much, uh, with a very positive note that I think these are tools of, uh, that, that uh, can benefit our society greatly if we use them correctly. Thank you to this panel. Thank you.